Good afternoon. I'm Clarissa von Spee, Chair of Asian Art and Curator of Chinese Art here at the Cleveland Museum, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this year's seventh annual Distinguished Lecture in Indian Art, made possible by the Dr. Ranajit K. Datta in memory of Kiran and S.C. Datta Endowment Fund. The annual Dr. Ranajit Datta Lecture brings to Cleveland nationally and internationally recognized experts in the field of art history and archaeology to discuss new scholarship, exhibitions, and discoveries, archaeological discoveries in Indian art. The late Dr. Ran Datta was passionate about Indian art history and he dedicated the proceeds of the sale of his spectacular collection of British silver to establish an endowment in honor of his parents that now provides the funds for this annual distinguished lecture series in Indian art. Our thanks go to members of his family, both in the United States and in India, for their continued appreciation of his support to the museum that he loved and served as a do docent for almost three years, uh, three decades. Dr. Datta was um, a good friend of CMA's former um, curator for e Indian and Southeast Asian art, Dr. Stanislaw Suma. And we are grateful also to Marjorie Williams, who uh, worked closely with Dr. Datta to establish this endowment. And I also want to give a special warm welcome to Ashim Datta, who is among us in the audience today. Before we turn the podium over to our speaker today, it is my great pleasure to introduce my dear colleague and good friend, Sonia Remace, uh, George Bickford Curator of Indian and Southeast Asian Art. Sonia does not really need an introduction, as she's one of the museum's most productive scholars and uh, most active curators. In 2016, you may remember, Sonia exhibited Mughal uh, and Deccan paintings from the uh, Catherine Glynn Benkheim and Ralph Benkheim collection in Art and Stories from Mughal, India. Sonia previously organized two path-breaking shows in partnership with the National Museum in Cambodia. Uh, one was Beyond Anchor, Cambodian sculpture from Bante Chma in 2017, and revealing, the, uh, and revealing Krishna journey to Cambodia's Sacred Mountain in 2021. Both brought spectacular stone sculpture from the National Museum uh, of Cambodia to Cleveland. Loans that could only be secured due to the close collab collaboration and trusted partnership that Sonia had estab established with her Cambodian colleagues over the years. As you may remember, Revealing Krishna centered on the museum's uh, monumental stone sculpture, uh, Krishna lifting Mount Govardhan, and in a digitally pioneering journey, the show virtually relocated the sculpture in the site um, from which it came. This year, together with our distinguished speaker, Dr. Deborah Diamond, Sonia is a hosting coordinating curator uh, of the current exhibition, A Splendid Land, Paintings from Royal Udaipur, the subject of today's lecture. Um, yes, so please um, welcome Sonia Mace. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Clarissa. I so appreciate that all of you have come here today and that we are able to hear a lecture drawing us ever more deeply into paintings of Udaipur, thanks to the generosity of Cleveland's own Dr. Ran Dutta. 
This year's distinguished speaker, Dr. Deborah Diamond, is the Elizabeth Moynihan Curator for South Asian and Southeast Asian Art at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art, where he, she has served for 23 years after receiving her PhD in South Asian Art History at Columbia University. She is the co-curator of the special exhibition, A Splendid Land, Paintings from Royal Udaipur, now on view in the Kelvin and Eleanor Smith Exhibition Gallery until September 10th. It is a distinct privilege to hear directly from an originating curator of the exhibition the aspects of the works of art that she finds most compelling. I am excited to see the works through her eyes. Deborah's magisterial slate of exhibition and publication accomplishments is a testament to her wondrous, truly original ability to see artistic greatness and material that was previously overlooked or ignored, and then to inspire others to see it too. Paintings that were dismissed by the Academy as late or decadent, Deborah is able to recognize as the works of creative genius they are, and bring them forward without prejudice so we all can know to revel in them, our eyes opened to really seeing them for the first time. This ability to see works on their own terms may stem from her early years as a student of modernist design and art history at the Parsons School of Design and Hunter College in New York, where she completed her BFA and MA respectively. Her approach to Indian painting first and foremost as the work of artists with fabulous color and design sensibilities and secondarily as exemplars of an art historical style has led to a fresh approach to the study of paintings made during the 1700s and 1800s primarily from the Rajput courts of northwestern India. The revelatory exhibition, Garden and Cosmos, Royal Paintings of Jodhpur, was the first major expression of her curatorial vision in an internationally touring loan exhibition, which was on view in 2008, co-curated with Catherine Glynn Benkheim, who is here with us today, and the late, dearly missed, Karni Singh Jaisal. The accompanying catalog received the College Art Association's prestigious Alfred Barr Jr. Award for Museum Scholarship. Garden and Cosmos was followed five years later by another monumental success, Yoga, the Art of Transformation, the catalog of which received the first place award of excellence from the Association of Art Museum Curators. Some of you may remember the Yoga exhibition, which the Cleveland Museum of Art hosted in 2014. Exhibition catalogs are not the only manifestations of Deborah's role as a leading scholar in the field of Indian painting. She has also published widely in journals and academic volumes on irresistible topics, ranging from occult science and Bijapur's yoginis to holy in the zenana, genre, style, and sensibility, along with numerous studies addressing aesthetics, ecologies, and connections across cultures. I look to Deborah as a curatorial sister. She and I and our institutions, the National Museum of Asian Art and the Cleveland Museum of Art, have not, not only shared our exhibitions, so the NMAA hosted CMA's Revealing Krishna exhibition in 2022, but we have also shared the majority of the Catherine Glynn Benkheim and Ralph Benkheim collection of Rajput and Pahari paintings, amounting to more than 250 important works from Rajasthan and the Western Himalayas. Together with the Cincinnati Art Museum, which holds 20 works from the Benkheim Collection, we will be responsible for publishing and exhibiting that distinguished collection in joint projects that are currently underway. We look forward to years of fruitful collaborations, a wash in color and creativity. Now, however, it's time to get in the mood. Let's all welcome Deborah Diamond, who will regale us with images of place and plenitude in Udaipur painting. Thank you, Sonia. Oh, thank you everyone for being here today. I am really delighted and honored to be at the Cleveland Museum of Art, which I consider one of the greatest museums in the world. And Sonia, thank you for the way too kind introduction. I just wanted to thank um, some of the extraordinary staff members here at Cleveland who have made my visit possible to Cameron, Aaron, Jeff, Andrew, Katie, and to Clarissa Vanshpi, whose exhibition 
China's southern paradise is going to be the hit of this coming fall. And last but not least to Sonia Mace, who, those of you who are in Cleveland, I hope you know what an extraordinary jewel she is, a brilliant curator, an extraordinary scholar, and the epitome of generosity and grace and friendship. So thank you very much for making this possible. It is always great to collaborate on exhibitions and on publications with you. I'm also very deeply grateful to the family of Dr. Ranajit Tata for their generous commitment to Indian art and scholarship. Thank you, Ashim and Priya for coming today. And I hope that today's talk is a good introduction to a project that took many years, I think 10 years, um, in the making. So I must just bear with me for one moment, warmly acknowledge with gratitude and respect the scholarship of exhibition co-curator Dr. Dipti Kera, professor of art history at NYU and IFA. And also, none of this would have been possible without the partnership of the City Palace Museum of Udaipur and the Maharana of Mewar Charitable Foundation. My thanks to, my deep thanks really, to Sriji Arvind Singh Mewar and his children Raj Singh Mewar and Padmaja Parmar and to the administrators, curators, and conservators at the City Palace Museum, as well as those at my home institution, the National Museum of Asian Art, to my husband, the photographer Neil Greentree, who made many of these images possible, and to all the friends who have, and the art lovers in the audience who have come here today. So first, let me take you to Udaipur. Have you been there? You can raise your hand if you've been there. Okay, some haven't, so we'll go back a little. The Kingdom of Mewar is located in the southern portion of what is today the state of Rajasthan. It is nestled in the Aravali Mountains, and it was established in 1553 as Mewar's new capital, replacing the previous fort capital of Chittor. The city's founder, Maharano Uday Singh, chose its location on the Girra Plain for its security, but also for its ecological sustainability. I know that this map is sideways, but I wanted to um, orient it for you all. Within the dry mountainous landscape of southern Rajasthan, Lake Pichola and the white city of Udaipur will appear as a shimmering oasis. The semi-arid region was and is to a certain extent still dependent on an unpredictable monsoon but its watersheds and its natural depressions allowed for extensive water harvesting. To create Pichola, for example, the lake that is at the heart of Udaipur, Uday Singh's engineers expanded an existing water body. And then, over the years since, Udaipur's kings remedied successive droughts and grew the economy. Remember that India was underpopulated until the 19th century. So they grew the economy by creating more lakes, Jaisaman, Rajsaman, Rups, there are many. Local communities then built yet more wells and smaller dams, and together, all of these lakes and tanks and wells and dams transformed a very dry region into a thriving agricultural zone and a water-filled oasis. The, the vast city palace was built over many centuries and that appears on the left of the current slide. All of the paintings in the exhibition in a splendid land were made by artists who worked in the city palace and that's where they were first viewed. Today, the city palace is home to a major museum and since 2018, it is also the site of a world-class conservation lab for painting. To make a splendid land, we borrowed works from the city palace museum as well as from private and public lenders in Australia, Europe, and the United States. And among those treasures are three paintings from Cleveland Museum of Art. I challenge you to find them upstairs. So why did we choose Udaipur as our focus? Around 1700, its court artists created a new genre of painting. Their large immersive works are unlike anything else in Indian art although it had never been studied as a genre until Dipti and I were working on this. Painters sought to convey the emotional tenor and sensorial experiences, which in Hindi is the word bhav, B-H-A-V or B-H-A-V-A, 
they sought to convey that mood and emotion that makes places and times memorable. So each painting in this new genre will convey what it's like to be in a particular place with particular friends or allies or lovers over a couple of hours on a particular day. So for example, in the second decade of the 18th century, this visionary painter conjured the ambiance of Udaipur at dawn. The painting on paper measures about three feet by five feet. So it's immersive, you can enter it. <coughs> Beneath a rosy sky, the grand city palace, this, the city's fortified walls, green hills, hunting grounds, villages, and temples surround a spectacular lake. And it's worthy of note that the lake is at the center of the painting, which you don't see in the work from other places, except maybe the paintings of Venice. Anyway, if you look closely at the painting, you'll see that city dwellers and villagers are going about their morning activities to the sounds of dipping oars, splashing fish, the scoop and swish of a water wheel, and dams and sluices and wells signal that Lake Pichola is both man-made and well-used. Now, okay. above and around the city palace, this is the exciting moment in this painting, as it existed when it was smaller in the 1720s, are washes of scarlet, gold, and blue that swell into fur, fur they will swell into billowing clouds to evoke the sense of sunlight streaming upwards through clouds. Our painter, whose name we do not know, combined translucent layers of thin paint with scalloped contours of gold. The painting's patron, Maharana, Maharana means great king, Maharana Sangram Singh II, who ruled from 1710 to 1734, appears first seated on the raised prow of a royal barge near the Jagmandir Lake Palace. He's sitting in profile, which was the preferred view for Udaipur portraits until well in the 16, 1860s. And he has a green halo rimmed in a golden sunburst. The king appears again on Lake Pichola's shore, indicating a successive moment in the morning's activities. And to the king's right, we see his young son raising a gun to shoot a tiger. The artist deploys the visual technique of sequential narrative to depict one tiger, there's only one tiger in this story, as the tiger enters the scene on the right, comes padding forward, gets shot in the forehead, and finally kills over dead. Now for years, scholars categorized paintings like this as royal portraits. That, the exhibition proposes, is really quite reductive. The Maharana did not shoot the tiger, and he's certainly not the central focus of the composition. The painting subject is its mood, its bhav, the bhav of an enchanting realm at sunrise. So the painting extols the dynasty's beneficence and the kingdom's prosperity. And like so many of the paintings that you'll see upstairs, our painter pays very close attention to the lake as a project of civil engineering. So in the upper details on the screen, you can see the embankments that created this lake. Um, and you can also see the jagged edge of a smaller tank named Dudtalai and the cows and the herdsmen walking along towards Dudtalai highlight the history of cattle rearing that took place around this smaller reservoir. Some of these cakes, some of these lakes, I just want to impress this upon you, were really quite massive. One of them was the largest artificial lake in the world until the 1960s when the Aswan Dam was built. Um, and when you return to the galleries, I mean, we have quite good details here, but you can see even better when you look closely that in the hills around the lake, you're gonna find deer, antelope, boar, rabbits, fish, and turtles, and actually several more views of the tiger as it lurks around the city, as well as the people of Udaipur washing their clothes during their morning ablutions, gathering and gathering firewood. So in the 1700s, when this painting was made, so it dates from around 1722, 
depicting the mood of a time and place was an entirely new goal. And it's a difficult goal. So I thought of a way that might make that more clear by bringing the artistic challenge into the present. So if we were Udaipur painters um, commissioned to capture the bhav of today, we'd be seeking ways to record the most iconic vista of the museum, the scud of clouds, clouds across the sky, the affection we feel when we run into our friends, maybe in the gift shop, uh, perhaps the turn of a staircase, the darkening of a lecture hall, and I hope the satisfaction of having sat through a very good and illuminating lecture. <coughs> but how did Udaipur artists organize time and space into painted moods? What we'll see is that painters consciously and purposely rejected the constraints of a singular focus. They rejected a singular moment and a singular viewpoint for an aesthetic of multiplicity and plenitude. You will again see a map on its side. Prior to the research that Dipti and I did, this sunrise painting had not been studied at all. And one of our earliest projects, which was funded by a Smithsonian Institution research grant, was to map all of the natural sites, like the lakes, the mountains, and the rivers, that appeared in all of the paintings, which we did with GIS mapping. We learned that painters, who were also the kingdom's map makers, followed the very same sort of visual logic that would have been used on local regional maps. So every site and every building and mountain is in the correct east, north, south, west relationship so that the painting's multiple actors are actually moving across the painting in the same directions that they would be moving in real life. However, the size of each element reflects its importance to the story and to the overall mood. That's in complete contrast to what happens in Renaissance paintings, when the size of each element reflects how it would appear to a single viewer, a single disembodied eye. <coughs> Our Udaipur artists also used multiple vantage points. So important fa building facades and, and people are always drawn in elevation view as if seen from straight on in the form that is most easily and immediately recognizable. Individual buildings, on the other hand, will combine plan views and elevation views, which is really very clever because you can immediately recognize the building from its facade, from its elevation view, but you can also see the layout of each room because you have the plan view as well. And artists also used uh, bird's eye vantage points. So in this painting, the lake gets condensed in an oblique perspective, and that enabled the artist to represent the temples and the hunting lodges that appear on the west shore of the lake in the foreground of the painting. And finally, artists oriented each painting in whichever direction would best convey the story and the mood. So in this painting, which is about a glorious sunrise, east is at the top. So, Sunrise in Udaipur, which is a painting that Dipti and I got to title, epitomizes how by the early 1700s, painters focused all their, 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 their creative energies on visualizing the sensorial, the embodied, and the environmental experience of the city and its palaces, lakes, and hill sites. The cartographic placement of sites made them eminently legible to anyone who knows Udaipur. The scale, this painting is about three by five feet, made them immersive. And then on top of that, painters imbued each scene with mood. And as we shall see, they made mood into memories. The monsoon rains, which are due in Udaipur each summer, provide the rainfall for the year. Located um, in arid Northwest India, in a region that had only one perennial river, the kingdom depended for its prosperity on those rains. A failed monsoon led to food shortages and inflation. A succession of poor rains meant famine and civil unrest. But in happy contrast, abundant rains were a source of delight and wealth. 
Now, not incidentally, because soldiers and merchants could not travel on, on roads during flood season, uh, the summer months also became associated with romance. Now, I know that the rains this week in Cleveland were really quite bad, but in Rajasthan, those kinds of rains with that kind of extensive water harvesting infrastructure were a source of delight and joy. Sorry. Yes. As the first rains fall, the searing heat would lift, the hills turn from brown to green, and the air smells and colors of the sky change. So tapping into that love of the monsoon and all of its aesthetic histories, Udaipur painters celebrated that feeling of ebullient relief when rains filled their cities, lakes, and reservoirs. This monumental celebration of a summer monsoon day was painted in 1860. 1867 to 1868, about 150 years after the sunrise painting. Um, if I may just like be very professorial here for a moment, you will notice the title of this painting, Maharana Shambhu Singh on a Monsoon Excursion, uh, privileges the, the Maharana, and that reflects an earlier period in art history when that was the way we cataloged paintings. But again, um, it's a misleading word order for it implies that these are portraits full stop. As in sunrise, the painting turns out to be about much more. But let's first look at the painter. For this is one of several paintings in a splendid land that includes a self-portrait. The artist Shivlal was the son of the court painter Tara and the brother of the court photographer Mohanlal. For this monumental work, Shivlal faced west in order to depict Udaipur, which is located on a ridge, from a vantage point that would elevate it and exalt it. His monsoon scene is resplendent, and it's also quite unnaturalist, unnaturally naturalistic. A line of white cranes, a classical symbol of monsoon beauty, sparkles against the dark sky. The rain is a shimmering gold veil, and golden light falls on the city of Udaipur. In Shivlal's hands, the hill's sharp rocks become white flecks that catch the light and sparkle even more. Teal and emerald slopes ripple and flow downwards, inviting the viewer to enter this lush and magical landscape. Shivlal paints himself, brush in hand, with a drawing board leaning against his cummerbund at the bottom of the scene. And it's, it's raining, so, and he's working in watercolor. So streaks of blue and red are dripping down the painting onto his drawing board. It's a wry observation. It's a bit of humor as the liquid color liberated by the rain stains the front of his garment red. So what was the medium? For those of you who are not familiar with Indian paintings, they are in the medium of opaque watercolor, which is closest to what we call gouache. Most of the pigments were made from minerals, such as lapis lazuli, or 24 karat gold. Other pigments were made from organic materials, like lamp black, or like Indian yellow, which in Rajasthani is called peyori. And that's a, a pigment, now outlawed and impossible to find, prepared from the urine of cows who had been fed only on mango leaves. Whether organic or inorganic, the ground pigments were mixed with water and gum arabic. And then they were put, they were laid out onto paper called vasli, which was made from cotton. India is the land of cotton. Each sheet of vasli is very thin, but in Udaipur, artists glued together numerous sheets to make sturdier supports, more like cardboard, for these larger paintings. Uh, the detail on the upper left. Um, shows you it's a picture of, of a woman painting. Um, you can see that Indian artists typically worked sitting down with their paper supported on a board. And it was very key that the surface of these, the surface that artists worked on was very smooth. So they, they burnished the Vasli paper by rubbing it with a smooth stone. You can see one in the detail on the upper right just by the bowl of brushes, one of those stones. Um, and then each time the artist laid down a color, they could turn the paper upside down and again burnish it on the back 
fusing the paint and the, and the pigments together so you get this very glossy, glassy like surface that shimmers. It also makes the gold shimmer in the paintings. And artists drew the compositions and painted in the colors with these squirrel hair brushes. So back to the painting. <coughs> At the center of Shivlal's painting, we see Maharana Shambhu Singh and his courtiers gallop up, stopping to enjoy a group of dancers and musicians. And then to indicate the passage of time, we see them again, now they're enjoying a royal picnic served on round banana leaf plates. The picnic is actually an annual tradition of the court that takes um, place on the first day of the dark half of the monsoon month of Shravan. Now, the work's date holds clues to its style. Shivlal's brother, as I mentioned before, Mohanlal was a photographer, and the painting Smooth Recession into Deep Space suggests that he was familiar with the aesthetic of the view in early landscape photography. However, while his main vantage point was taken from the southeast, the emphatic curve of the lake or the shape of a particular, the, the mountains reveals that he actually very cleverly combined different views together. So, um, the painting was probably made to depict the annual monsoon picnic of 1867. The inscription on the back tells us that it entered the court 12 months later in the summer of 1868. Now, at that point, it must have provoked a really complicated and poignant response because 1868 was the year of a terrible drought. And this picnic's luscious mood and the, the hills you know, that were totally green would have been the stuff of memory. So we can also see how these paintings recorded moments um, moments of pleasure, moments of prosperity, times of friendship, and then sort of cemented them into the memory of the court. So here is my example to show you sort of how the scale changed when the artists moved towards paintings of place. And I wanted to go back to the earliest paintings for this group in order to show you sort of how the art developed, both in terms of composition and style, but also in terms of, of mood. So we're very fortunate at Cleveland Museum of Art to have two folios, this is one of them, from the earliest surviving manuscript from Udaipur. It's dated 1605. Now, this is a kingdom with a very long history and surely in their earlier capital at Chittor, they had wall paintings, they must have had maps, they probably had construction drawings and they could have had paintings on paper, but nothing survives. So what we have are folios from this manuscript known as the Chawand Ragamala. And let's see. So the painting embodies, did anybody go to the concert last night? Yes, wasn't that beautiful? Okay. So, um, at the concert last night, um, a sitarist and her students um, played a number of classical music compositions called ragas, and each one has a mood. And this painting embodies the mood of a raga called Gunkali. And the mood of Gunkali is the mood of longing, longing for a lover who is not present. So inscribed in the upper margin in an early form of Hindi, is a verse that describes that longing. It reads, the heroine desiring union with her husband pines and waits for him under the soft, beautiful feathers of a peacock. Our heroine, blue-skinned and wearing a peacock feather skirt, <coughs> plucks flowers as she awaits her lover. You will notice that there are many pairs in the painting two round pillows on the bed within her palace, two water jugs on a low table, two ducks, two peacocks, two white jasmine garlands hanging from the trees. And these pairs reiterate rhythmically a lover and her beloved. And in, in this painting, call attention to the fact that he's not there yet. So um, those are all conventionally recognized determinants of romance. And even though this painting is quite abstract, 
um, and idealized, what they convey in the language of Indian aesthetics is she is yearning hard for that man. The folio epitomizes the early style of Udaipur painting, which art historians relate to a Western Indian style of painting known as Chura Panchasika, after its most famous manuscripts. For us today, its key characteristics are unmodulated fields of saturated color with a preference for red backgrounds, idealized figures, which are here in part because in the very long history, the very 2000 year tradition of Indian aesthetics, it was understood that ideal characters as opposed to quirky individuals would be best suited to engendering emotional responses in audiences. Um, in this Chora Panchasika style, the figures are always represented in profile. They have square heads and almond eyes, and the women are typically wearing black pom-pom jewelry. The verse and the, sorry, I should go back, sorry. The verse and the manuscript reveal that the painting expresses the mood of Gunkali Ragini. Um, and so in that sense, like this painting is like an echo of a musical event, but it's also a visualization that could heighten the experience of listening to Gunkali for anyone who was a connoisseur. So you would hear the rag, the raga, and you would remember this painting and you would know that the emotion you were supposed to be feeling was, was desire and anticipation. Now, during the second half of the 17th century, during the reign of the ruler named Raj Singh I, who ruled from 1652 to 1680, Udaipur painters began producing royal portraits. I mean, this is a huge change from idealized ideal heroes and heroines to specific historical characters. <coughs> and two of these very early portraits of Raj Singh are in the exhibition. And the one here that I'm showing us today depicts Raj Singh romancing a woman. His parrot beak nose, handlebar mustache, the little line of hairy chest are all observations from life. He holds a jasmine garland in his, in his hand, which mingles with the melody of the raga that's being played by the female musicians right outside the pavilion. Um, because there's this heavy monsoon dark cloud hovering above, the raga is likely Malhar Raga, a monsoon composition that was a favorite of this Maharana. And so the painting is enjoying the monsoon and praising Raj Singh as a sophisticated lover. And all Indian rulers were expected to be sophisticated lovers. And more broadly, they were all expected to be enjoyers of art. They were expected to, this is all kings, were expected to um, engage with art, to play with their male companions, to flirt with women, to sport with them sexually, to patronize art. And the whole culture drew on a medieval um, ideology of enjoyment um, by which kings were understood to enjoy their realms. So during the 17th century, when royal portraits become a key mode of expression, as they, um, the king as enjoyer becomes a focus of painting in the Hindu courts. Now, the Hindu courts of North India begin adopting royal portraiture at this time because they've become part of the Mughal Empire. The Mughals are a dynasty from Central Asia. When they came into India in the 16th, yeah, in the 16th century, their um, Emperor Akbar began patronizing portraiture and it catches on like wildfire. Whether the court is a Hindu court or an Islamic court, it doesn't make a difference. All of a sudden, all rulers, are, or most rulers, are having their portraits made. They articulate their rank, prestige, and status. They trade them like baseball cards. Everybody does it. But in Hindu courts, like Udaipur, we have them doing specifically kind of things that express Hindu kingship, like being a good lover. Now, in 1700, there's a further change that takes place in Udaipur painting. So now we not only have the king and the portrait of the individual king, but we have the individual king in a specific place on a specific day. 
So in this painting, which dates again from the 1720s, we see the king of Udaipur, Sangram Singh, um, entertaining the king of Jaipur, a very powerful Hindu kingdom just to the north, um, at Jagmandir Lake Palace. And as you can see from our comparison to the photograph from today, um, the artist has chosen a small chunk of this lake palace in order to focus on what's taking place um, at this meeting. If we look at two maps of India, we get a sense of the politics that are behind this switch. The earlier map depicts the Mughal Empire in 1648 towards the end of the reign of Emperor Shah Jahan. And you can see pretty much that um, they have power um, and legitimacy in most of India covering Pakistan into Central Asia. If we look at the map from 1789, you can see that the Mughal domain is very tiny. It's, it's kind of centered around Delhi. So what happens in this period? So what happens in 1728 when the painting on the right is made? What happens is that as Mughal emperors have less power, they have less power to back individual kings. And so therefore, uh, individual kings, whether they're Hindu or Muslim, must create new relationships, relationships of loyalty, or uh, relationships with, with allies in order to sort of maneuver and maintain power in this sort of shifting landscape. It's kind of like what happens in Washington, D.C. every time we need to elect a new Speaker of the House. There's a lot of jockeying that takes place. So if we look closely at the center of the painting, we see these two powerful kings, um, both from Rajasthan, um, at a kind of G2 meeting, right? It's a summit meeting. Um, and what the artist has focused on is recording them as enjoyers of art and culture. Sangram Singh, the Udaipur ruler, has got like flowers tucked into his turban and into his belt. So there's like the smell of, of like beautiful fragrance is taking place. Jai Singh from Jaipur, who's wearing fabulous jewelry, is lifting one of these flowers, you know, to his nose. This is what's getting recorded is, I'm sure they're doing meetings that are about real kind of alliance building. What gets recorded is them being connoisseurs. The artist has taken this little slice of Jug Mandir and made it into a particularly idealized moment. The moonlight is, is turning everything silvery. Um, the pavilion is, is sort of anchored by the, by the cypress trees in the garden. The artist has taken care to depict you know, the fish and the crocodiles in the lake so that we get that sense of like water gently lapping, lapping against a building on a moonlit night. This is the stuff of memories and alliances and power. This is the language of power in 18th century India. Now, over the whole course of the 1700s, Udaipur is involved in plenty of battles. There's one painting of a battle that I know. Probably Kathy Benkheim has found several more. But the point is, is that this is how power is typically expressed. Now, how do we know this about, about Pav? Um, we know this because on the back of the paintings, there are often very long inscriptions that can begin with, the, this is the translation up on the right, that the scribe is telling us this painting is the mood, the bhav of the temple of Sri Eklingji. And then he repeats it. In fact, like it's the mood of Sangram Singh arriving for worship at this temple and then proceeding by horseback. And it goes on, this inscription goes on and on and on and on. I will not read it to you as a kindness, but what I, I do point out is that all of the courtiers are named. Because again, this is a way of bringing them into a power structure, a way of recording their presence. We can see, of course, at the center, this is a fabulous, huge painting upstairs. We can see the king and the courtiers worshiping uh, Shiva in his form of Sri Eklingji at the center. And so that one doesn't get a reductive idea of what constitutes the mood of visiting a temple in 18th century Udaipur. It begins with a refreshing dip in, um, you know, in the lake 
um, above as everybody, you know, um, floats on these little, inf little kind of inflatables. And they seem to be like smacking each other with fish and in general having a good time. And of course, because this is Udaipur, you can see all of the structures that made these lakes possible. So it's a celebration of that. Finally, I just want to focus on one more painting, if, if, if I can, um, in the time left. And, I, and it's because artists in the 1720s do something that I find so exciting. They are grappling with this question of how do you depict the passage of time? How do you convey the mood of an event that starts in the morning and goes all the way to the evening? So if we look at this painting, we can, and we just look at the pictures of the Maharana in the lake, um, we see three, three images of him on a boat in the middle of a lake. So we know that's sequential narrative that's already now 2,000 years old in India. It indicates the passage of time. We can look more closely at this detail. And this is described in great detail on the back. So we can see that the king, surrounded by jasmine garlands, is leaning over his boat at what moment and talking to a particular takwar. That's recorded for all history. That's like a moment of power, right? The festival is dedicated to the goddess Gaudi. And during the daytime, a drummer will come and the women come out of their house and they'll take images of the goddess and put them on their heads and walk towards the river. It's bright sunlight. Because the format of these paintings is large and there's an aesthetic of plenitude, we get all sorts of humorous little genre details. Like in this case, there's a little child there who clearly has gotten tired and doesn't want to go on and his mother's picking him up. We all, we all know what that's like. Um, but then here, here's where it gets like just mind-blowingly brilliant. Um, if you look at that silvery water, if you look at it from the perspective of, of, the vil of the city of Udaipur from below, it's daytime, it's silvery water. If you think about it from the perspective of nighttime above, it's reflection. Or on the right is the ghat, the steps where the women are taking the goddesses to Im immerse them. And here the artist used these raking diagonal shadows so that he could like interweave dark night and light day. Just totally creative, coming out of nowhere, but grappling with this problem of time, narrative, and storytelling. Then of course, up above, you know, we get the sense of, an, of a painter who has walked through the city streets of Udaipur, peering down all its alleys. Another genre scene, it looks like uh, one of the fireworks didn't go off. So they're all kind of like fleeing. And then it just ends at the top with just a luminously beautiful explosion of fireworks into the night. Paintings like this would have been viewed by the king and the court in painted rooms like this in the city palace. And when they looked at paintings, they were laid out on flat tables that were usually low. People are usually sitting on the floor here. So <coughs> when they sat down in order to write the inscriptions and look at the paintings, they would have had a sense of light striking the gold on the paintings. And we lose that in museums when we hang them flat on the walls. So when you go back to the galleries, if you could just kneel on the floor, like these viewers are doing, um, that's the professor of art history from Harvard. Um, you will see the gold come alive and get an experience of what it was like for the king and his courtiers to view these paintings. In order to make the bhav and the mood and the emotion um, more apparent and more graspable, we created a new way of organizing Indian paintings just for this exhibition. We've organized them by emotion. So all of the emotions connected to the city palace are in one room. All of the emotions connected to the monsoon are in another room, for example. And in order to bring out those emotions, uh, a filmmaker, a great filmmaker, named Amit Tata from Himachal Pradesh, created soundscapes. And those, that's what you hear when you're in the exhibition. He, he's a filmmaker, so he also thought about these as narrative. And the ways that he thought about the story of each sound are also on labels in the galleries. 
So I encourage you to return to the uh, galleries later and um, enjoy the sounds and the paintings. With that, I'd like to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you. In order to express passage of time, I know in some works you know to read them left to right or up to down. Is there any pattern that we're supposed to follow? Oh, that is such a good question. I, I should have paid you in advance to do that. <laughs> no. Um, I think there's multiple ways of entering each painting. And maybe the reason for that is that they were looked at not on the wall, but looked at in a way where everyone could sit around them. But these are just paintings that take a lot of time to look at, and you can wend your way in from multiple directions. So I will say it's part of the aesthetic of multiplicity. Um, you said that, um, sorry, let me sit, that these paintings were a demonstration of power um, and that they were also viewed within the palace. So I'm wondering who the viewers were at the time. Were they just members of the Me Mewar elite or, what, or did these larger paintings also circulate, let's say, to Marwar, Jaipur, etc.? This is a very good question because you're asking where the painting circulated. So in Ulaipur, what we can tell from records is that the king and the court looked at them. We know from other kingdoms that women, women of the court, also looked at and even patronized paintings. We also know that smaller paintings were given as gifts or taken as booty, and those circulated around. <coughs> but I'm not sure that we have any examples of these very large paintings circulating from place to place, although I do see an echo of the large paintings in later 18th century paintings from Jodhpur. So we don't know if the artists moved or, or the paintings moved. I hope that helps. Do you know why the selected way of portraying all these were always in profile or not almost always in profile as opposed to f f straight on faces? We don't really know why. I mean, we do know more about certain courts, but our evidence is visual. So unlike China, which has a very long history of art historical writing, or, or the West, which since the Renaissance, right, has a long tradition of art historical writing, we don't have texts about paintings. There is an incredibly long, deep, and complex 2,000-year history of writing about aesthetics in India, first in Sanskrit and later in regional languages, in which they discuss aesthetic emotions in drama, in poetry, and in music, but they don't discuss them in visual art. So we can only use the evidence that we have from paintings. Rajasthani paintings in which, I mean, certainly the ontological distinctness of the king who has a halo and is clearly above and different from other human beings is f formally represented even in the act of making love. So there's a certain distance and a, and a recognizability. But we could have, I'm just saying, that could have its own separate conference. It's a good question. I was really struck by the image, the aerial view of Udaipur from modern times, um, and, and as well as by some of the photographs in the gallery depicting a wedding and whatnot. And so I'm just curious, you, you showed the paintings, there are sparse villages all throughout for much of the, at least of the images in the, in the gallery that you presented. So I'm just curious about the, the context behind this evolution from the city, or rather from the, the region, from this kind of sparsely populated area into this huge, almost metropolis that it is today. Wow, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer that question. 
But I will say that, and I mentioned the thing about India being underpopulated until the 19th century because it's so counterintuitive for those of us because India is the most populated nation on earth right now. Um, I do know that today's Udaipur has 500,000 people, which by Indian standards makes it quite a small city. Leave it at that. Should I wrap it up? Okay, with that, I think I want to thank everybody for coming, and here comes Sonia. Thank you very much. Brava, Debra. Thank you so much for that glorious lecture. And thank you again all for coming today. And we look forward to seeing you back here next year for the eighth annual Distinguished Lecture in Indian Art, um, thanks to the Datta Family Endowment. So enjoy the rest of this glorious weekend and a splendid land.